Hello and welcome to Spy Hard's podcast where your hosts go deep undercover into the world of spy movies to decipher which films make the knock list. But remember this information, it's strictly for your ears only. I'm Agent Scott. And I'm Cam the Provocateur sailing in on Insolent Minx. <laughs> Cam, what were you thinking? It's actually a really good question actually because... Uh, <laughs> When, when talking about this film we're talking about this week, we have a lot of questions about what they were thinking in terms of making it. So we thought we'd bring in the expert. We have Brendan from the What Were They Thinking podcast. Hello there, Brendan. Hello. Thank you for having me. Um, I do think it's weird that uh, you brought me here to talk about, I mean, an, a, a flawless film, uh, a, a perfect <laughs> uh, cinematic adaptation from across the pond. It's beloved. It's beloved. I, I don't know what we were thinking. This was a very misjudged decision in terms of bringing on a guest for this episode. I blame Scott. Yeah. It's usually the best reason just to blame me anyway. That makes sense. Um, but before we maybe tackle the film a little bit, let's, let's hear from Brendan. So um, tell us a little bit about the show and a little about yourself and, and films. What made you get into reviewing films? Uh, well, I mean, I just got into podcasts. Prob- I mean, I just got into podcasts themselves probably about five or six years ago. Um, I was listening to, you know, the big ones, like how did this get made, uh, stuff like that. And I was just said, yeah, I, I want to talk about bad movies. That sounds awesome. So I started, to, uh, maybe, maybe I, I, reg- I regret it only a little bit. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so I have, uh, what were they thinking? It's a podcast about bad movies. Um, I also do another one though, called for screen and country, which is, <laughs> we did the, the, we went through the British film Institute, top 100 British films of all time. So oh, it was quite a contrast. Yeah. <laughs> it's quite different. So, uh, I've been kind of all over the place. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I have to know. What do you think of the Ipcris file? I love the Ipcris file. Ah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, we're not getting off on a good foot here, Brendan. I love the I love the paperwork. I love the trudgery. I love the I love how it's like the anti bond. I I can't lie. I love the Ipcris file. Now, I have a question. Why the BFI versus the AFI list? Like what kind of drew you in that direction? Specifically because I think they're well the they don't do it anymore because they've gone through it, but there was a pretty major podcast that did go through the AFI. So I thought, well, mm-hmm. what other kind of list is there? And I was like, I know we'll get two Canadians talking about the top 100 British movies of all time. <laughs> yeah, we're Commonwealth. It makes sense. Yeah, we, we all used to be part of the same thing. We're good. And let's be fair. You all want to be like me. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just me wanting to be British. The whole That's the whole podcast. That's actually what it comes down to. <laughs> it's why Cam hangs out with me. He just wants to adopt the accent. And, uh, well, <laughs> and accents are plenty are coming up in this episode. Yeah, oh, no kidding. Oh, no kidding. oh boy. <laughs> now, when you're talking about bad movies, um, what to you are like the perfect bad movies? What are the ones that really excite you to talk about? Because Lord knows there's a lot out there. Yeah, I mean, I think, okay, so number one, I think a bad comedy is, like, the worst bad movie. Mm-hmm. Like, that's just, that's just, it, it's, usually they're not even, like, unless it's, like, a crazy 80s thing, then you get the, you get in a good mix. For me, it's, like, it's pretty much anything, pretty much a lot of stuff from the 80s, and especially the 90s, especially the stuff that uh, we kind of breezed past and maybe doesn't age so well in 2021. Um but I really like, uh, I mean, one that stands out, I mean, a, a classic is like Maximum Overdrive. Like, that's just a ridiculous, <laughs> insane, bad, like, coke-fueled bad movie. Uh, but, like, maybe even something like, uh, there's a weird teen comedy called Whatever It Takes from, like, 2000. And there's a there's an off-screen rape uh, about about 90 minutes into the movie, and it's treated as, like, a hilarious joke. Oh boy, so it's like Revenge of the Nerds, sort of. Not quite as bad, but it's like a guy goes into a room. Well, it's the same level, though, because a guy goes into a room, in a dark room, the girl thinks it's her boyfriend, and, you know, they have sex, but she doesn't know who he is the whole time, so, yeah, it's pretty rough. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah like, it, it's funny how comedies, at the time, people, like, laugh, and then after about 20 years, you're like, oh my god, oh my god, what were we doing? It's so crazy. Yeah. And it, if you're tackling bad movies, I imagine you stumble across a lot of things like that. And then sometimes there's there's gems. Like, there's been a couple times where I'm like, you know what, I almost genuinely like this movie. <laughs> like, sometimes it happens. And for me, like, when I think, like, the bad movies I love, it's things like... um the uh jaws three and four like any bad shark movie will win me over but also things like the early days of superhero movies where you would have like look 
no one will say anything bad about like the Tim Burton, you know, Batmans or Richard Donner Superman. But then you had like Superman four and some of the like, you know, Spawn and Blade three and films like that. It's actually funny you mention that because I cannot recommend enough 1990 Captain America. <laughs> oh, is it Albert Pion? I think directed yeah. that. Yeah, there's a whole joke where his bit is that <laughs> he's a passenger in a car and, and uh, he, he does this twice. He says, I think I'm going to be sick. So the guy stops the car and they both get out and then Captain America runs back into the car, steals it and <laughs> drives off. Classic cap maneuver. <laughs> Heart of America, baby. Now, have you ever tackled a spy movie when you're talking about bad movies? Oh God, I don't. Any think... James Bond or? Surprisingly, no surprise. I've been thinking about doing a Bond because there obviously is like a, f a few candidates, but not. No, I don't think we have actually. <laughs> That's crazy. Well, Die Another Day is out there and it's waiting for you. <laughs> and that um, one with uh, uh, Grace Jones and what's that one? Living. Uh, a view to a kill. View to a kill. Yes. Leave that film alone. How dare you? <laughs> How dare you blaspheme it like that? I, I, we've certainly encountered a few uh, honor or dishonorable mentions. We even have a list of films dedicated to it called the uh, Disavowed List, where they are the, the worst of the worst that we've encountered so far. And uh, yeah, if you ever want to look at that list, it might give you some good fodder. Hmm. Yeah, I might actually take a look. Actually, you have that on Letterboxd, do you not? We There's do. There's a plug for you. There's a plug. Oh, That's right. <laughs> this man's a professional. <laughs> <laughs> just, like, uh, just like our lead this week. Yeah. But uh, I do I just want to ask one final question, Brendan. Now you are our guest. Um, and I know you haven't spoken about uh, spy movies on your podcast, but you personally, just what are some of your favorites? I mean, just to dig the knife a little deeper, I do really like The Upcrest File. <sighs> yeah. Also, like, I know it's probably, I don't know, it's probably an easy answer, but something like even like the first Kingsman movie was a lot of fun. Like, they kind of took it and uh, and spun the, the genre on its head. I've never been like a huge Bond person. Like, I don't hate them, but I just never, I mean, Casino Royale was great, but like, I've never really gotten super attached to those movies. But I, I do, I do like, um, I, a Spies Like Us, a classic. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> That's on our list. One day down the road, we will be tackling Spies Like Us. I remember nothing about that movie. <laughs> I've never seen it. Uh, well, um, we've been talking for about five or six minutes now, guys. So I think it's time we all just change our costumes and dye our hair. <laughs> uh, and whilst we're doing that, Cam, why don't you tell everyone what we're talking about this week? Yes, we are tackling 1997's The Jackal, starring Bruce Willis, a um, very loose remake, I guess we could call it that, of The Day of the Jackal from 1973. Now, I... Uh... I <laughs> this film, this film. Okay, I'm gonna get the letterbox.com synopsis out before we talk about it. So let's let's uh, let's just do that part. So, the jackal. How do you stop an assassin who has no identity? Hired by a powerful member of the Russian mafia to avenge an FBI sting that left his brother dead, a psychopathic hitman known as the jackal proves an elusive target for the people charged with the task of bringing him down. A deputy FBI director, a Russian MVK major, and a jailed IRA terrorist who can recognize him. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I'd love to get rid of the last two people on that list, uh, just in terms of the film. But, uh, Ooh, that's cold. Maybe we'll get into that. But um, I guess we'll go, Brendan. Now, I know you've seen both of the films, the original and this one. Um, before you get into your review, do you, did you catch this in theaters back in ninety seven? No, I think I must have seen it on like the I must have seen it on like the movie network or something like a few years later. I just remember when I was a kid, I was the biggest Bruce Willis fan. Like anything he did, I was there. Like you know, Die Hard, all that stuff it was great. And then when I heard about this movie, and again, I was pretty young when this came out and i heard that he was a bad guy i was like no 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 i can't watch this there's no way i don't there's no there's a chance of him dying in the movie i can't see this but then i did and then i watched it like <laughs> a few months ago and then yesterday so <laughs> yep. i'm sorry 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, what what about you, Cam? Yeah, this fell for me age wise. I would have been sixteen, I think, when this came out. I can't remember if it was like towards the end of the year. I might have been seventeen, but it's like those teenage years where I'm going to movies almost every weekend with my friends and. You know, like Brendan, Bruce Willis was like a big deal at this point because you had Pulp Fiction, right, in 94. Suddenly, like, Bruce Willis was cool. You had Die Hard with a Vengeance in 95. And so I remember seeing ads for this, and it's like, oh, my God. Like, Richard Gere is like an IRA guy who's going to hunt down Bruce Willis. Like, this movie is going to be awesome. And I was also, like, the idiot that thought, like, you know, 3,000 Miles to Graceland was going to be awesome. And uh, was it 3,000 or 5,000? I don't even remember. It's three, yeah. Oh, perfect. And I remember the trailer for that. I was like, this is going to be the best movie of the year. It has to be. (laughs) And then it was anything but. And I think I had a similar sort of vibe with the Jackal where I'm like, I have to see this. I hadn't seen the original at this point in my life. So I was like, okay, I don't, that none of that was going through my head. I just had to see Bruce Willis as a badass assassin. And um, I hated this movie coming out of the theater in 1997. Even at the age of 16 or 17, I was like really angry when I came out and I didn't really write reviews that much back then, but I did write a top 10 of the year uh, all through the nineties. And I actually have my entry for the Jackal right in front of me. So this is from, I guess it would have been, yeah, this would have been like January 97 or 98, I should say. So I would have been about 17, I guess when I wrote this and it's very insightful. I'll say right up front. (laughs) Um, I named the Jackal as the worst movie of the year. And I wrote, The Big Tamale of Badness for 1997. An updated retelling of the 70s Day of the Jackal with Willis as a dull assassin who decides to kill a public figure in the most convoluted and over-the-top way he can think of. Phew. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Fair fair take. Fair take. Yeah. Now, um... Yeah, I, I suppose for me... And thank you for sharing that, Cam. I appreciate you going into your archives to pull that out. I I love hearing your old reviews. Your your one on Taken Two, I think, still still rings in my ear. Well, that was written almost what like fifteen years later or something like that. I think I had a little more skills in terms of writing than I had at the age of seventeen. Do you do you think that? Well, slightly, slightly, mm. maybe less grammatical okay. errors. Mm. Well, see, I didn't have much of a connection to this film. I had seen the poster from time to time. It had a little bit of a legend to it. But really, this one came onto my desk when we started the podcast because people would ask us, when are you doing the Day of the Jackal? And then they would ask, and you're also going to do the Jackal? And then they would make jokes about, yeah, good luck with that. And I'd be (laughs) like, how bad can this thing be? This is very interesting. So I purposely didn't watch it. I waited until now and I'll, I'll reserve my comments until we get to the actual review but uh it's definitely something to talk about yeah um, even jeff quest who guested on our episode on day of the jackal like we were laughing back and forth him and i about well scott you have the jackal coming up that that'll be something so yeah here we are and it truly was but uh cam open your shirt and tell us all about the film yeah, okay. So this movie was directed by Scottish director Michael Caton Jones. And he had made a few films at this point. He'd made uh, Memphis Bell, the World War II film. He'd done Doc Hollywood with Michael J. Fox. This Boy's Life, which was a early DiCaprio film co-starring um, Robert De Niro. And he'd also done Rob Roy with Liam Neeson. So he was sort of a studio guy, but he had some respectability because he genuinely had some good movies on his resume at this point. And he came across the script for this film, and it was written by an ex-Navy SEAL named Chuck Ferrer, who had written um, Navy SEALs, <laughs> coincidence, <laughs> the former Navy SEAL wrote Navy SEALs. He also had a writing credit on Dark Man, a movie I enjoy, also with Liam Neeson. Uh, he'd ri- uh, co-written tar- uh, Hard Target with Van Damme, and the Pamela Anderson vehicle, Barb Wire. So, again, sort of a studio guy, but this, you know, he came across this script, and was really interested in it. He thought it had potential. He, right up front, Michael Caton Jones, at every interview I've read, was like, oh, this was never a passion project. I just needed something to do. This was a job through and through. And uh, he did not revisit the original. He had no interest in a remake. He really said he just wanted to make this movie because he wanted to work on a big canvas, you know, do some globe hopping, 
and utilize all of the techniques he picked up along the way over the course of his, you know, work in film. It was basically a technical exercise for him. And um, so a lot of other writers came in. None of them are credited. Uh, the script, I think, went through quite a bit of it, you know, in terms of evolution or de-evolution, depending on where you stand. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, um, I'm, really, I'm really feeling the love from the director at this point as well. Like, I can feel the passion for this project. Uh, uh, yeah, that's uh, it's overwhelming. Uh, Michael Caton Jones said he didn't supervise any of these rewrites and he was never happy with the script and said he made the movie in the editing room. <laughs> <sighs> okay. Okay. This is going well. This is going well. Now, you have to imagine, this is a studio film starring Bruce Willis. Um, I would imagine the studio would be quite concerned. They want this to be a hit. Bruce Willis is a big name at this point. Richard Gere is still a big name. And uh, so apparently they really mucked about with the project and Michael Caton Jones said there was just genuinely a lot of fear from the studio in terms of their investment and whether this would deliver. <laughs> what did they have to be scared of? <laughs> <laughs> so he has a quote, Michael Caton Jones. <laughs> this was actually during the pre-release of the movie. This isn't years later. This is before the movie had even come out. He says... This was a job of work, not a passion of life. <laughs> it's harder when you're not making something personal. When it's personal, you're insane in some way and you'll fight to the death. When you're doing a job of work, it's an entirely different thing. A job of work. I don't think I've ever <laughs> heard it put quite that way. I'm glad he's not the writer. Or maybe he was one of the writers on this film. Uh, oh, man. No. I have no idea, but I thought that was amazing. And in the past, Scott, when we did, oh, uh, I can't, I think it was Born Ultimatum. We had some amazing quotes from Matt Damon about uh, Tony Gilroy and also some amazing quotes from Matt Damon in regards to um, the Born Legacy. This one might beat those. I'm loving some of these snarky quotes we're coming across. I, I just love that he's distancing himself before it even comes out. You know there's a problem at that point. Yeah, just just so you know. I don't care about this movie that I just made. So if you don't like it, that's fine. I won't take it personally. You think about like, um, what was the name of the chap who directed The Avengers? Oh, Jeremiah Chechik? Jeremiah Chechik. He defended that film up until release and during the release of the film. Even though, and he said to us in the interview, he knew it was a stinker. Yeah. He knew he had a problem on his hands. But he stuck by it. And he tried. He gave it the old the old try. But this guy just abandoned shit before the Titanic even hit the iceberg. He's like, see ya! <laughs> do you guys think that's that's like... What do you guys think about that? Because like that seems to me like I'm not willing to... Because that's it. Like, the, the director of the Avengers seems like, you know, I'm going to do what the studio wants me to do because I work for the studio, ultimately. Where this guy is just like, eh. <laughs> like doesn't That strikes me as a bit... Uh, as kind of selfish, in a way. I don't really get it because when you look at his other films, they're all studio films. So he's clearly working in the studio system and I would imagine he would want to going forward. Um, it just seems like a really bad choice if you want to continue working. You might as well just stick to it, let the movie come out, do whatever it does. And hey, you know what? That one didn't work. But hey, look at my previous you know, three or four films. They all seem to turn out okay. And it's like yeah. this director, he would go on to like... He, he did Basic Instinct 2, Risk Addiction, and that, like, pretty much killed his career in terms of, you know, big screen work. He, you know, does TV, he does the odd thing still, but, like, it's not like things got that much better after The Jackal, either. I'm sorry, did you say Basic Instinct 2's subtitle was Risk Addiction? <laughs> yeah, it, okay, so Basic Instinct 2, that was what it was, like, shot under, I think. And I think even international territories, they call it risk addiction. But for some reason in North America, they didn't. But I like to refer to it as risk addiction because I find that so much funnier. It's such a bad title. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it fits the movie. Yeah. yeah. I, well, it's one of those things, you know, your reputation in your industry will always follow you. If you're known to be someone who just doesn't give an F about anything that you do, that stuff does, does keep, does, you know, it just sticks to you. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so Bruce Willis, um, I found like anecdotes around online. I couldn't find anything sourced, which is why I'm not going to credit it as an actual fact. But I'll just say like there was various rumors that I came across that said that Bruce Willis was approached for the Richard Gere role, but really wanted to play the villain. 
I don't know if that's true. I could not find, you know, any sort of variety story indicating this or a Bruce Willis interview. But it's cited so much that you just wonder if it's maybe there's some elements of truth to that. Because I can't imagine they would want Bruce Willis for a hero role in a movie like this. It's all over the Wikipedia. Yeah. Did you see the same thing that I saw where they said they said that the roles were going to be switched? Because I saw that somewhere, too. Yeah, it's like the Wikipedia link is sourced, but it doesn't lead to a source that's actually yeah. citing any of that information. So, yeah, I don't know. Um, but Bruce Willis apparently was very involved in the Jackal's various looks. He was um, really <laughs> interested in the makeup and hair work he could pull off in this movie. Don't joke, Brendan. <laughs> We'll talk about that. Um, it's funny because it comes out one year after The Saint where you had, maybe it was the same year as The Saint actually, where you have Val what? Kilmer going yeah. insane with wigs and everything. Yeah, yeah, I think it was the same year. I think it was the same. So yes, it was a great time for um, A-list actors to be putting on silly wigs. And uh, the one bit of sort of, I think that's a little bit interesting about the production was there's the same sex kiss in this. And apparently the studio wanted to cut it the uh, test groups weren't thrilled with it that they you know ran through but bruce willis fought hard for it uh, i have a quote from him here he says i just didn't feel that it should be eliminated from the film because they're afraid of offending a certain segment of the audience i think that is more offensive so bruce willis in 2021 a little problematic but you know props to him in 97 for uh you know standing up for something like this we'll talk about whether that's effective in the movie but nonetheless good for him for fighting the good fight here I have a question about that, though, because is it... I don't know if it's this movie or Day of the Jackal, and I'm sorry if you've already said that this is a fact about Day of the Jackal, I'm sorry, but wasn't there a thing where, like, test audiences cheered because originally he, like, he kissed him and then he shot him right away, and, like, test audiences cheered, and they were like, whoa, we need to make it obvious that this is not why he killed him. And I think... I don't know if it's this one or the other one. Oh, wait, no, the other one that didn't happen. Never mind. No, it's... I actually came across that same thing. But when I went to the article, it was not mentioned anywhere in the article. Okay. It only mentioned Bruce Willis fighting for, um, you know, that scene. So I have no idea. Again, it's like, that's why Wikipedia, I'm always a little iffy on. You know, I always check those links, folks. Um, Rumor and, uh, and innuendo. Rumor <laughs> and innuendo. It's just like an encyclopedia. Just as, just as reliable. Yeah, totally. And so this movie, uh, well, we'll talk about the comparisons to The Day of the Jackal, but... Frederick Forsyth, the author of Day of the Jackal, not thrilled. <laughs> not thrilled at all. <laughs> and so he pulled an Alan Moore and was like, take my name off that. And so they did. Yeah, that's why it's just credited to the original screenplay from Day of the Jackal, not to his book. And um, also the director of The Day of the Jackal, Fred Zinneman, was not happy either. And so the studio shortened the name to The Jackal just to keep people somewhat happy. And were they happy, Cam? Probably not if they saw the movie. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell where this review is going, folks? <laughs> <laughs> it's on the knock list. Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Best movie ever. So this movie had a budget of $60 million. Domestically did 54.9, but international 104.4 for a worldwide total of 159.3. So like this was a solid hit. This wasn't like... A wild underperformer, but we should also note in 1997, studios cared a lot less about international money than domestic. So the fact it made less than its budget domestically, it was kind of a think of a you know we'll just let this one go. No, no jackal two for us. Unfortunately, no. The jackal lives. <laughs> the jackal, jackal takes Manhattan. <laughs> or maybe it's just called like the new blood, and we have a new jackal. He had a uh, child along the way. Jack Jackal just has to fight a, uh, a carry like character. <laughs> <laughs> I might like that movie more. We'll That'd see. Be fun. That'd be fun. <laughs> this one landed at number 24 for the year of 97 between Alien Resurrection and The Devil's Advocate. And the uh, top three were number one, I think it's pretty obvious, 1997. What's the number one movie in the world? Spit it out there Titanic. Boom. Number two was The Lost World. Number three was Men in Black. And a few other notables. Number four was Tomorrow Never Dies. Number 39. Oh, here we... I actually have it. The Saint was number 39. <laughs> number 45, Austin Powers, the first one. And uh, number 107, The Man Who Knew Too Little. 
And to close it out, number 116, Double Team, starring Jean-Claude Van Damme, tying it back to the writer. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> it all comes back to that. Well, um, I think it's time we actually get into the meat of this, because uh, you guys have seen it before. This was my first time. I'm going to go last, though, because we have a guest. So, Brendan, you've watched it twice this year, by the sounds of it, so you must really love The Jackal. Uh... What do you think? Uh, no, that is uh, patently false, sir. Uh, this is ah. this is this is not a good movie. Um, this is like the, okay when I think of like okay when I think of like American remakes of like far better movies from across the pond or you know from Japan or anywhere like that. This is like and they're and they're generally worse. This is this would be my exhibit A. Because this does everything wrong that they do. Like, it thinks everything needs to be bigger. It thinks there needs to be more, like, personal connection between characters that doesn't need to be there. Like, the original is such, like, like you guys talked about it. It's such a procedural drama. And this one is like, oh, Richard Gere and Bruce Willis have a history together. And, oh, there's this girl and he killed her baby and everything. And it's like, why? Why? <laughs> So yeah, no, not a good movie. I did not care for this film. <laughs> yeah, okay, you've definitely uh, put your stamp on that one by the sounds of it, Brendan. Um, Cam, uh, it has been, what, 20 odd years since you watched this film? Has it gone up in your books? This podcast has given me a lot of gifts, Scott. You know, getting to interview filmmakers that are really interesting or revisit movies I never, you know, had thought to revisit that I wound up really being excited to come back to. And then there's a case like this where I... When I realized we'd be revisiting the Jackal, I was like, that is not something I ever thought I would do in my life. <laughs> well, here we are. And I'll say this, for the first maybe hour of the movie, I was just kind of like stumped as to why, you know, 16 or 17 year old Cam was so angry about this movie. I was going like, this is like a pretty boring, you know, two star Hollywood thriller. Like, there's nothing here for me to particularly get wound up about. And then the second hour hit, and I'm like, oh, oh, of course. It's all flooding back in. Yeah, uh, this movie is really terrible, and I think you can really make a comparison when you look at the Day of the Jackal. Like, let's examine the weapons used by our title characters. In the original, it's machine tool to perfection. It's sophisticated. It's simple. It's efficient, and it hits its mark. Whereas here, it's overblown, stupid, and it misses every time. <laughs> I feel like you've been working on that for the last couple of days, and I really appreciate that line. Days? I just watched this movie, like, mere moments before we watched, or before we sat down to record this. Oh, fair enough. Um, right, well, I guess it's my turn now. Cam, I need you to just attest to something. Um, we have a rule here that I won't talk to you about my thoughts on the film before we record. Is that right? Yeah, except Condor Man, you're blowing up my phone for, like, days in advance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, that one did, uh, you know, that one did blow me away. But this is the first time I think I've ever broken that rule. I think so, yeah. I texted Cam one line. Man, the jackal is rough. <laughs> it It lived up to the hype of being... A bad film. I wrote. I actually wrote a little, a little encapsulation of my thoughts because I had to sit through this thing twice. Hmm. I wrote listless and classless. Somehow manages to dull any form of sharp wit of the original. Where there once was tension and intrigue, we now have CGI trains and talking computers. Oh. I. 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 Do you know what, what baffles me? And I'm going to throw this question to the two of you because I would consider you both more learned when it comes to films than I am. I don't know how they effed this one up because The Day of the Jackal is simple and it's executed to perfection, except for the fact he misses the target. This one, they've taken the template and just somehow just like, they've just missed the eggs. They've spilt the eggs on the floor. The flour's gone everywhere. They've not made a cake. Somehow they've ended up with just this bubbly mess. And how have they just effed it up so badly? I don't know where they went wrong. Brendan? Uh, it just, it just like, it, it's, it's even if you don't, even if you haven't seen Day of the Jackal, like if you have seen Day of the Jackal, it's like, why did they make this stupid action movie 
and claim that it's based on Day of the Jackal because it's like it's it's not it's barely like you said it's a very loose remake. This is not about the French president. This is a revenge movie, I guess, kind of. Um, it's just it's just a mess. It's just like there's there's so many there's so many characters you don't care about. There's terrible accents, <laughs> which I'm sure <laughs> I'm sure uh we'll get into at some point, but. Um, it's just, I don't know. I, I can't even describe why it's so bad. It's just, um, it, it's long and it's boring and it's just, uh, it's just an absolute, it's just a mess. I think what it, the problem is, is that you look at the original and it is, as we've said, a procedural. And when you look at the editing of that movie, it's sophisticated and comes across relatively simple, but it isn't like that would be a quite a difficult movie to make. And, um, it's the sort of balancing act you would not get in a Hollywood studio movie of the 90s. Like, they're looking for a safe sell. And what they've done is just pumped it full of melodrama and the kind of lazy writing you would get in some of the other, like, Bruce Willis thrillers of this sort of era, like Mercury Rising, you know, things like that. These thrillers that have been pretty much forgotten. Um, it just has that kind of, you know, check the boxes... Uh, you got to have a shootout every 15 or 20 minutes. Um, there's some John Woo ripoff stuff here where, like, the two characters just, like, stare at each other for prolonged periods of time. It feels like it's ripping things off instead of what Day of the Jackal was doing, which was really trying to create a vision of what they could do. Like, that's kind of trying to push the docudrama approach. Whereas here, it's like, how do we make a pretty by-the-numbers Hollywood thriller with this template? It it blows my mind when you look at the cast of this film. We're talking Bruce Willis, Richard Gere, Sidney Poitier, um, and then people like J.K. Simmons, Jack Black are also in the film. And this film seems to have just been forgotten. It's just not a 90s film people talk about, but it's got this all-star cast. And, well, quite rightly it's been forgotten because it's absolute trash. But it's just weird that that's happened. Well, I don't know. Do you remember Mercury Rising? That's another one that's not talked about. Like, there's a lot of those thrillers from the 90s that they were total star vehicles. We don't make them as much anymore, and if we do, they go to Netflix. But back in the day, if you had a star, you would just put them, you know, in the lead of a movie like this, and people would genuinely show up. You know, I think of movies like uh, Fallen with Denzel Washington was another one. Um, the Mothman Prophecies with Richard Gere. <laughs> like, no one talks about any of these movies anymore, but... They opened back in the day. They probably did at least okay money. And it was just really just building star vehicles around established names. Which, I mean, I'm sure that when they landed Bruce Willis and Richard Gere, they're like, there's the movie. That's all that matters. By the way, those two movies you just named, far better movies than The Jackal. Well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, I'm I'm curious. I think before we... Uh, dissect this film anymore because I do want to talk about some of the bad stuff I really do let's just maybe tip our hat to some of the things we did like if there is anything and th I mean I'll start I'll give us something I think Sidney Poitier is great in this film is he? I <laughs> think like he's fine I, it's the best thing about it I think he his acting is good I think he's severely miscast though yeah like sure. I think it's weird that it's like an older man in this role that I don't know that sticks out to me for some reason. To me, it's just sort of uh, like I don't know. I think of with Sidney Poitier, so many of his great performances in Guess Who's Coming to Dinner or Lilies in the Field, like a lot of his powerhouse work of the past. And I watch this and I'm like, why is he playing this ultra boring role? Like this would have probably there's a pretty good chance this would have been my introduction to Sidney Poitier. And oh, wow. <laughs> I know, right? And coming back to this movie, I'm like, I didn't even remember he's in it. Weirdly, like, Diane Venora is the one that jumps out much more to me, where I'm like, this character in a different movie, I would have enjoyed seeing her as the lead, because I think there's a little more there, and it feels like it would be pushing the thriller in an angle we wouldn't get in another 90s, you know, Hollywood movie. I think for me, she's the star that jumps out. I, she's got that air to her, and she's the next on my list in terms of things that like. She reminds me a lot of Linda Fiorentino's character in Gotcha, mm. where I, I actually want to spend more time with her than I do with Anthony Edwards. Yeah, because she has that um, bit, you know, where they say, where she says something about, you know, about the good guys have to keep going or something along those lines. I don't remember the exact line. It's not the, oh, the good guys don't hide. That's the line. 
And I'm like, that's a really interesting quote for someone who's working for, you know, Russian authorities going up against the Russian mob, like someone who is putting their life at risk every day in a way that, you know, even like American law officials aren't as much. And I'm like, that's a story I would like to know. And the movie just kind of brushes her aside and makes her a tragic death to give Richard Gere motivation. But I'm like, I would watch a movie about that character, preferably not a loose remake of The Day of the Jackal. <laughs> Yeah, the movie the movie fridges her real hard. <laughs> like it's just, <laughs> and 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 I love how just about that scene real quick when she does get killed, the jackal like gives her a message to tell Richard Gear like he can't protect his women, and she tells it to him. <laughs> like why are you burying the knife deeper? Like why would you relay that as you're dying? Oh by the way, you can't protect your women. Okay, bye. And it's like, the jackal kills a lot of people in this movie. She gets, like, the most cruel death where he, like, shoots her in the liver or something. Yeah. And it's just like, you're going to die really slow and horribly. But please, just pass on my message to Richard Gere. (laughs) She Come on. He draws a little heart on her face with her own blood. That's like (laughs) insult to injury as well. Yeah. Uh, Definitely not uh, the Edward Fox style. No. And he goes through so many personality changes, like as many changes as he does disguises, because he's supposed to be this like this like by the books, cold blooded, you know, hitman, kind of like Edward Fox in the beginning. But then at some points he gets deranged and he's screaming and he's like he's going over the top. And I'm like, who are you? Like, what is your character? I mean, he does become a slasher villain at a certain point. Yeah. Yeah. He's cackling in the end scene in the shootout. <laughs> yes. like, it, it's crazy. I, um, but we're, we're not there yet. I, I'm going to press you, Brendan. Give me one thing you like. Oh, my God. Um, well, it was nice to see J.K. Simmons. Yeah. <laughs> sure. He didn't do anything, but it was nice to see him in the film. I also think he's he's one of the dumbest characters in the movie. Which is saying something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who's dumber, the people in the movie or us for watching it? No, oh, you got a point there. Yeah, yeah, and you watched it twice, Scott, so, uh, you know. So did you guys collectively. I so did like true. I did like Richard Gere at one point saying, shall we dance? Oh, that's not bad, yeah. <laughs> like, this is not a particularly quotable movie, um, which is saying something. You know, you've got Jack Black here clearly improv his way through scenes. There you go. But that's, like, that's my highlight right there. That's that scene. Oh, is Jack Black is. It's in this movie. It doesn't. It's it's stupid, and it's just like a part of this dumb movie. But that was the only moment in the movie where I was like, okay, this is at least like something. You know what I mean? I can say that like this was the scene. That scene where he, you know, he guns down Jack Black was the like only real scene I remembered in the entire movie. For like 20 years, basically. Where apparently Jack Black's motivation in that scene was, try to piss off Bruce Willis for real. Yeah. <laughs> because it looks like he, it looks like he's legitimately about to punch him in the face. In, the, in every interaction. I didn't understand bits of what Jack Black was even saying. I was like, what? Like, was this slang in 1997 that I now don't know what it means? <laughs> oh, what he was saying. What was the word he was saying? It uh, started with like SH, I yeah, think. Squall. Squall them. Is that what he was saying? I think so. I think he was saying, yeah, you got to put... I thought he was him. saying sp- spool, as in, like, it, how, a, how a gun whines, like a machine gun spools. Oh, I thought he was just a big Timothy Spall fan. Oh, yo, that's what I would have assumed, yeah. Um, <laughs> is that is that what he was saying? I was baffled, because he kept saying it over and over again. <laughs> yeah, he did. There was a lot of ADR when Bruce Willis was on screen. <laughs> Although, I will say... Okay, Scott, you're asking for things that we liked... And I can be kind about something else. Okay. We are at an era where uh, where um, Bruce Willis is not phoning it in completely. Like, he seems like he's somewhat engaged. He has that still star charisma when he's on the screen. So, like, that will vanish. You know, you jump forward, like, 20 years, and you are getting a Bruce Willis who is barely alive on screen. Here, he's still grounding the movie fairly well. You you could tell if it was uh, Bruce Willis now doing it, he would just be wearing really loosely fitted toupees and stuff to change costumes. You see the hair. I'd be surprised if he wore the costume, to be honest. Well, yeah. Like, if it were Bruce Willis now, you would buy that he would blend in because he's invisible on screen now. He's just like a ghost <laughs> traveling from scene to scene. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, all right. I, I think we've probably got as much good stuff out of this film as we can find. 
So I'm going to bring up my first issue. The entire film. No, um, Richard Gere. The character. Yeah. The entire Declan Mulqueen character. A complete addition to the entire story uh, for some strange reason that I still can't quite understand why he's in it. But not only is his accent incredibly bad and offensive, <laughs> and I'm not talking on behalf of Irish people. I don't know if they find it offensive, but just like, I just don't understand why he's here. He, he, I don't enjoy him. I can't understand what he's saying. His accent switches between Irish and Scottish whenever he seems to get a chance. It, it confuses the hell out of me. It also sometimes goes from like, vaguely american to like lucky charms like it goes back and forth <laughs> all the time okay okay i i'm glad you mentioned that because it's it's a note i have written down it was a scene i was going to point out but when he has the reunion with his like ex-girlfriend isabella and he he goes to her house and just to set the scene for you he's reuniting with a woman he loved in the past that was actually the the mother of his child who was lost and it's meant to be a tender moment, but she's married with kids now. He goes up to the house and she says, oh, to her husband, oh, just take the kids over there. And then proceeds to like nuzzle with her right in front of the husband. And I'm like, <laughs> I, I just like, I, I wanted to see the scene where the husband turned around and just goes like, hey, hey, lucky charms, get off my girlfriend. <laughs> like, uh, he didn't say a word. That's like the weirdest marriage ever. Yeah, I would have a lot of questions if I was the husband. And I don't know that I necessarily hate the idea of a remake of this where they pit a IRA, you know, terrorist in this case, against an assassin. Like, I think there's something interesting there. Like, that could be, the, you know, fodder for a good movie. I was saying earlier, there's like John Woo type moments where they're staring at each other. I could see like a John Woo action movie doing something like this or a movie inspired by John Woo stuff. And it working. I think for me the problem is is that the Richard Gere character is silly consistently. He's also often very passive, just kind of following along with what other people are doing. If he was hunting him on his own, that might be interesting. And also, he is the introduction to all of the melodrama of this Isabella character played by Matilda May, who is not even a character. I don't I barely know anything about this woman. She pops in and out of the movie. But it's all about just injecting melodrama, and it's all about Richard Gere doing that. So that's what makes me hate the character all the more, is that everything he's introducing sucks. Like, Sidney Poitier could just be there solving the whole thing. Like, I, it, it, he is completely useless, like you said. And, and, and all he does is bring that unnecessary drama into the movie. Like, in Day of the Jackal, we don't need Edward Fox to have, like, a connection to you know someone else on the in the police or like you know no one's helping the police find him and like it's just it's just it's just the hollywood blah 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 well it's like jaws the revenge this time it's personal right it's just like jaws the revenge <laughs> and i i had a question um really early on the first time you meet richard gear he's in he's in prison they make a lot of effort to show him shadow boxing in prison <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like, really give him his time. He's got a good minute of just sweaty, shadowy shadow boxing, just to really give Richard Gere that hero shot. <laughs> and then, not once in the entire film does he lay a hand on anyone. No. No, I mean, they build him up as this marksman, and I guess you do get the him sniping the, you know, the jackal's gun at the end, so that's something. But, like, everything that happens in the finale in terms of, you know, the big showdown between the two guys. There's nothing there that you really buy that he succeeded because of all of this training, all of this shadow boxing. It feels like something that, like, you could have easily cast Harrison Ford as an everyman who's tossed into this situation, and you could have had the same outcome. Well, maybe, guys, maybe it's to show us that he's in such uh, such great physical condition later in the movie when he's running after him through the subway. <laughs> oh, my God. Those trains. Uh, that scene yeah. of him between those two moving trains was unbelievable 1997 CG at its worst. I was going to say unbelievable in that it was not believable. <laughs> yeah. I really want to see like the uh, the behind the scenes feature right of just him in the green screen room with just the sign, the, like the, the light box and just him making that jizz face as he's just holding onto it. <laughs> and just it vibrating in front of him. Uh, I'd love to I, see that. I, I also don't like, you know, the Richard Gere character 
introduces all this stuff as we said with Isabella and this he can't protect his women also there's kind of a misogynistic edge to this movie and it's not as like pumped up as say some of the other action movies of the era but it's there and it's kind of insidious the way it works itself into all of the character connections that basically lead the movie right to the end where you have the jackal holding this like you know very upset young woman hostage at the end holding a gun to her head and yelling out see i told you you can't protect your women it's like what like i thought this movie was about an assassination attempt how did it wind up in such weird kind of icky material you guys don't remember the scene in day of the jackal when edward fox is holding that girl hostage <laughs> come on <laughs> Well, <laughs> that's also when he goes into full screech mode, too, by the way, when he's just like yelling <laughs> like, Declan, Declan! <laughs> uh, oh, actually, while we're on the, the topic of uh, Declan, not Queen, Cam, I have a question for you, as you're notoriously bad with accents. Mm. How did this rate in your sort of accentometer? Could you tell this was a bad one or was this fine in your book? I thought it was bad, but I thought he made a smart choice in playing it as kind of a lilt versus going all in like Donald Sutherland in um, The Eagle Has Landed. Like, to me, that one sounds more overtly cartoonish. This one just sounds like an actor kind of struggling through a mild accent. Now, the real question is, have you guys heard Christopher Walken's Irish accent in Wild Mountain Time? No, I haven't. Oh, I think it might be I worse. Want to. I think it might be worse than to. Gears. <laughs> I will say, though, you know, when we're talking about accents, I was more offended at Bruce Willis's Canadian accent than I was by Richard Gere's Irish accent. Was he trying to do a Canadian accent at one point? Yeah, he did. Yeah, when he was using his cover of Charlie Murdoch, he says something like, oh, make it to Charlie. Oh, okay. And I was like, what was that? Oh, and he throws an A on the end as well. Yeah. <laughs> was When he went to the, um, he collected the gun, he went to the internet cafe. Was he also Canadian at that point? Okay, you know what? This is something else to gripe about. I guess I'll raise this as mine. So you look at the original movie, right? Which is hopping locations throughout the disguises. Mm -hmm. I had almost no ability to keep track of the locations throughout this movie at a certain point, as well as why we were switching from disguise to disguise. Mm. Because the original, it's procedural. You are watching how a hitman goes about his job, lines up his target, gets all the you know logistics into place, and proceeds on the mission. Here, you strip out all the procedural. All the stuff we get here that are ties to the original movie are basically just set dressing. You know, They're basically there for you to go like, oh, cool, that was in the original movie. It doesn't mean anything. And so I found myself genuinely confused at points where they were hopping around locations, mostly in the second half. Okay, and talking about his disguise for a second, because you said he just changes disguises all the time. There is literally a scene in this movie where he has like a, a whatever, like a brownish uh, wig on as he's getting onto a boat. In the middle of the boat ride, he then has a blonde wig. After he gets off the boat, he has a different wig. <laughs> Why? Why did he have to change and then change again? <laughs> Was the blonde hair just a dye job and he was wearing wigs on top of the blonde dye job? Uh, but my, maybe, but like, why did he change <laughs> during the boat ride, but then change into a different one before he got to land? Like that, I don't understand. Who are you changing it for? Wait a second. This is 1997. He does the fifth element the same year. Is Bruce oh, Willis shit. really into blonde hair at this point? <laughs> it might be. <laughs> Blonde hair and Chris Tucker is his favorite, two favorite things. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> I tried, I, surprisingly, with the whole costume changes, I really thought someone online would have like tracked the amount of changes in the film, but I can't find that number anywhere, and I was not going to sit through and do that myself. If you do know, if you're listening and you know how many changes, let us know. But um, I, I give him props for changing it up. I suppose Edward Fox only has a two changes, more or less. Both more convincing. <laughs> True. Yeah, and Edward Fox, when you see him in that movie, you buy that this man could blend in. There's nothing about him that would stand out in a crowd. Bruce Willis, not the same. Bruce Willis isn't really, I mean, I know he plays an everyman in Die Hard, but he's not really an everyman walking through this movie. He's in very good shape, and he just kind of has that movie star swagger. So I guess they felt like they wanted to amp up the disguises to explain why he blends in. 
but yeah, the disguises are like, you know, the Val Kilmer saint. Like, they look really silly, and they're often accompanied with, like, accents or, pa- you know, paunches on him. Like, he's wearing, like, full body, like, um, you know, like, I don't know, like, I don't even know what to call them, like, prosthetics or something like that at points. He must have, like, eight suitcases with him at all times, because he has so many costume changes. The, my favorite, by the way, of uh, my favorite of which is the Freddie Mercury mustache and crop top hair that he's got later on. <laughs> Oh, you see, I come down more on the ponytail. I was like, that look would only be... Is that with, like, the goatee as well? Yes, goatee and ponytail. And I'm like, that look would only, like, fly in 1997. Like, that is something you probably saw in, like, a Seinfeld episode of that era. I guess I'll stop growing my hair then, (laughs) Cam. Honorable mention to the preppy boat owner, one that he does later. Hmm. I, I had a question while we were talking about um, costume changes and the internet cafe scene, because I, I get also confused in the plot itself, and it's something I'll get onto and sort of this whole convoluted story. But he goes to pick up his gun, which is a lot cooler in the original, but he collects his weapon and then apparently he's intercepted and people are trying to take him down for some reason. I didn't get and that. It, yeah. See... Yeah, this is it. I, I, I had to track it in the second one, so I can sort of give you the story, but I just wanted to see if you guys got that. All I got, I, well, I didn't know who he was talking to, first of all, in the internet cafe. I guess that's like his handler or something. But yeah, he said, uh, the, 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 the whatever has been compromised. And then they, he says hijackers. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, I yeah, I had no idea either. Mm. Well, you have that thing about the shipment being hijacked and that he like, kills a guy with, I guess, a needle or something on the car and poisons him. So you're like, okay, that went nowhere. It was basically like a little con- you know, convoluted complication they introduced. The same way they do later with, like, the traitor working with, like, you know, Poitiers and the team, where there's, like, the random mustache guy that gets walked out of a room. and But it's, like, introduced as just these momentary complications that mean nothing to the larger picture. No, see, the second one happens are in the original. yeah. Because there's the whole honeypot thing in the original where you have that, that lady spy yeah. and the horse and the dog. That whole thing. That's in the original. But this one... So, okay. In the second watch, I had to try and track this down and try and figure out exactly what happened. So, the gun was... He collected the gun earlier in the day. You saw him go and he did the whole funny accent. He's wearing the prosthetic suit and he's got the cigarette packet in his pocket. The, the trucker outfit, I think is what I put it down as. Hmm. Um, and then he sort of... He has to stay... He's in Montreal at this point. And he has to stay there for the night before he moves on. So he's just hanging out in town. He has to contact his handler, which is the the Stephen Hawkins computer voice robot that I want to talk about some more in a little bit. But um, so then he messages those people, but he notices he's being watched. So they already know it's him because he collected the package. They were watching the station when he collected the package. They know he collected the weapon. He's then told by his handler that he was compromised. And so he then drives the minivan into the car park, sprays it down to change the thing, and then kills one of the assassins uh, with some sort of weird spray that they don't really explain. And to be fair, I started foaming at the mouth when I tried to explain it as well. So I, I definitely struggled. Was it the spray? Or I thought maybe he had like a poison needle on the handle that the guy grabbed. No, it was a spray. So he touched it and then he sprayed it afterwards and he held his mouth and then, then he walked away. So it was whatever's on that spray was some sort of like, I don't know, some sort of chemical that would kill you. The way that was filmed, though, it looked like, like I'm, I'm assuming they're trying to tell us that if you inhale it, it's bad. But the guy touched it with his finger and then immediately died. <laughs> like, no, no pause whatsoever. Just just fell over dead. I mean, if you it, there's some chemicals that it, it does that does happen. If you do touch them, you will die quite quickly i don't think it's as quick as that but hey it's hollywood i suppose but it, i mean it, it's an it's an indictment on the film because we're all sitting here confused and we all watch a lot of films and the original is like a complex movie in terms of all the moving parts in terms of the procedural nature of it but in terms of a story you understand very clearly what it's about it's about the authorities trying to stop the jackal from committing an assassination here sort of the same idea but at the same time they keep introducing these weird complications that throw you off in terms of what your focus is and obviously once all the stuff with Isabella comes in you're just like I don't even know what I'm watching anymore like what's this movie about 
Yeah. It also in this movie, I feel like you don't you also don't get that sense in the day of the jackal where you're like, I kind of want to see if he succeeds. Like in this movie, you're just like, oh, they got to catch him. Like, come on, get the jackal. Like, you don't really care about him succeeding or failing. You just want to kind of want to get, you know, find out how uh, how they catch him. But you're not invested in like his journey as much as you are in the day of the jackal. I think that's one of the things uh, we're not we're not trying to talk about Day of the Jackal too much here, but I think that's something that it does well is it sets up Edward Fox as your protagonist, even though he is a villain, and also gives him. I mean, obviously he is a hitman, but the people hiring him have a, a lofty goal in mind. They're trying to protect the interests of Algeria and its history. There's a whole, you know, actual political geopolitical history involved. Now, I mean, this has. Some geopolitical stuff has all the Russia bit at the beginning that I don't know why they added. And they even like, uh, like Isabella's characters, like from the Bansk region, which they bring up, which is a whole other conflict. And you'd have to know that to understand. I, again, confusing and another convolution that just makes it more complicated. Um, but just to sort of dig into it, I, I really would like to know why they felt they needed to add all of this extra stuff. I I, th- I think that's a trope of remakes, honestly, like cross cultural remakes. I think that happens with like so many american remakes that they they don't it's like when they when they do it they're like they don't understand what makes it good like what makes people like it they just think it's the you know it, it it's you know we'll add more action people will like it even more like I, I don't think i don't think they understand like the core reason why people like these uh these older movies yeah, and I mean, they're hiring the writer of Hard Target and Barbed Wire. <laughs> like, they're not hiring... <laughs> they're not hiring someone to make a sophisticated adaptation of this um, source material or anything. It's like, we want a pulpy, you know, star-driven action movie. And they're just kind of pulling from the thriller playbook. Do you say Barbed Wire is not sophisticated? Well, you know, it is a loose remake of Casablanca, so perhaps it is. Uh, yeah, that means it's just as good. Yeah, it's about equal. Oh, yeah. And by the way, tune in to our Spy Master interview with uh, Chuck Farah later this week. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> As if. Um, <laughs> so I, 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 I've said my piece a little bit, but Brendan, some things you disliked that we haven't maybe called out yet. Well, you guys mentioned it real briefly, but I just want to draw another comparison to how much this sucks as a remake. Because you you mentioned that there's the scene <laughs> there's the scene where that guy is like a traitor. Like you have that whole investigative unit or whatever, and, and that guy turns out that he was giving you know Bruce Willis these messages. I guess he's the handler. I don't know, but he's giving him like this intel that only he could have, right? And they have that scene where, you know, Richard Gere tells them there's someone in your unit or he, you know, he goes, there's someone in your, <laughs> that horrible accent, but he says, there's someone in your unit that's, uh, that's, you know, you have a mole. And so Sidney Poitier comes in and he plays like the recording. It's right from the original film, but in this one, it doesn't, it just happens and then it's done. Like it doesn't matter. In the original film, it's like, there's a, there's a female character that is like, seducing this guy and like stealing the information and then he feels like ashamed that this has happened and walks out in shame and it's a big moment in this movie it's like oh yeah let's just do that but like let's just we don't need the other stuff which is crazy because in every other scene they add so much more stuff (laughs) You you know what i mean like here's a question should they have just stripped out all of the nods to the original because like things like that are just weightless like they mean nothing in the movie you also just have the stuff with like you know the jackal you know changing the color of his car and stuff like that you know there's no real it, there's no real payoff in the movie about it you have him going to the in this case a gay club to pick up a guy again like why it doesn't pay off in any sort of interesting way that character is unceremoniously killed after about 10 seconds later in the movie it feels like when they did these sorts of things in the original, there was actually like a reason you understood through the psychology of the Jackal character, but also like it felt like it fit into the procedural nature of the storytelling. Here, it's a lot of just like loose little bits where they're like, ah, well, that's in the original, so throw it in there. Even though the really like pumped up melodramatic nature of the storytelling means that none of these things are effective. Yeah, and and little little stupid things like when he gets on the boat like why why when he puts the gun in like whatever he puts it in in like part of the boat and it fits perfectly like that's such a just a stupid action movie trope like why why have that scene 
That's from the original. Is it from the original? He hides the gun in the car. Yeah. Oh, okay. In, in the pipe of the car. So they, they, but again, they've taken it and they've made a scene out of it. But really, it's pointless. Yeah. Like it doesn't. There was no. Uh, you don't even see him take it out of the car again. So there was no reason to hide it in the car. Well, again, that just says to me that they don't understand what the source material is because they're replicating it. But that's all the. the that's all they're doing. They're not. They don't understand why. What makes it like good? Well, we're going to go back to the fact that the writer made barbed wire. Again, I don't think he understands many things. I don't know what you're, what point you're trying to make, but when you keep saying that, <laughs> um, it's a remake of Casablanca, guys. Uh, um, let's talk about the gun because you know the original. It's this really like lean and efficient weapon we see Edward Fox carrying throughout the movie. Um, what did you? Uh, well, Scott, I want to hear from you because you hadn't seen this movie. When you saw the introduction of the weapon in this movie, what was your takeaway the first time? I think my initial reaction was, huh, that's shit. Yeah, that's that's absolute trash. I mean, they've taken something that was cool. It's like it's like taking Bond's PP7 or PPK, depending on which one you want, and just giving him like an M16. Yeah. It, it loses all of its cool, its finesse, its charm. It's gone. Because it's just a big rah-rah machine gun at that point. Who cares? It's also like that era of like Arnold Schwarzenegger carrying like massive machine guns. Because, you know, one year before this, you've got like a racer where he's got like the, t- the double rail guns. So it's like, it's all about big, like, you know, over-the-top explosive guns in movies. And it seems like they're going there. But I didn't understand why they create this ridiculous looking concept and we have him setting it all up and it looks absurd to assassinate someone with like it's like there's a lot simpler ways than this massive hydraulic gun that would weigh a ton and is very iffy when it comes to controlling it because i didn't understand why they show us this gun and in the filmmakers minds they're like this is cool people are gonna think this is really cool but then every time we see him use it it misses (laughs) It's really weird. <laughs> and that's a gimmick again from the first one, but it doesn't make any sense to carry over. And and this is the thing, like you have later in the film when the jackal goes to make his shot on his target. And I want to talk about the target in a little bit too. But Richard Gere shoots at the jackal's car from even further away and hits the car. So why can't the assassin that is the jackal just use another sniper rifle that the jackal's using and make the damn shot? Because bigger's better, baby. <laughs> Why does he need a, like a chain gun on a carbon fiber hydraulic stand made by one Jack Black, who winds me up to no end in this film? Oh, see, he kept me invested for that ten minutes <laughs> or five minutes or whatever it was. When Jack Black is in a comedy and he's playing Jack Black, I'm okay with it. Okay. But the second he comes out where he's like a rigga goo goo, and then you just like, oh my god, shut up, shut up, man. <laughs> See, I'm okay with Jack Black. This is the era where it's like, okay, he's, you know, not a star yet. So he kind of just injects some energy into a character that otherwise could have been pretty forgettable. He was scatting, Cam. He was scatting in a film about an assassination attempt. <laughs> um, I have a quote from Roger Ebert that just popped into my head that I feel is important in terms of underlining how absurd the Jackal's methods of assassination are. And I just remembered this, reading this back in the day. So Ebert said, The Jackal strikes me as the kind of overachiever who, assigned to kill a mosquito, would purchase contraband insecticides from Iraq and bring them into the United States by hot air balloon, distilling his drinking water from clouds and shooting birds for food. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, guys. I just thought of another thing that's really annoying about this movie, and it's a trope that shows up in so many bad movies. It's when they have to have a a plot point happen, um, and the only way they can do it is that suddenly they have to make a character make a really stupid decision that they probably wouldn't make. Like, you know, in the beginning, I mean, I guess they kind of set up J.K. Simmons as like a by-the-books guy, but they really don't. They just kind of say he is later. But they they tell him, like, you know, don't put, um, what's her name again? Sorry, Diane Venora. Or don't put Isabel. That's who it is. Don't put Isabel's name in your book. Like, don't keep a record of her. Because if someone finds out and the jackal gets to her, you know, she's toast. And he's like, yeah, yeah, no problem. And then he does. And then, like, he's like, oh, you idiot. 
Like, he's supposed to be this, like, super, like, I just don't think he would make that mistake. Like, that just seems so stupid to me. Like, the, the, for the for the Jackal to find them, he had to be a complete moron. Well, okay, why at a certain point in this movie does the Jackal, who is sent to kill the First Lady, and I think we're going to talk about that in a bit, as Scott was implying earlier, but, like, why, when he's on this mission, he's being paid, I think, $70 million dollars, does he decide to drop everything to go hunt Isabella? What what good does it do to his plan? How is it helping him? It could only cause problems. And then, yeah. like you have at the end of the movie, Isabella shows up out of nowhere. I don't know how she would have known to show up at that subway stop out of nowhere with like seconds notice to save the day. But it's like, why is this character, who's not a character, we know next to nothing about her as a personality. Why is she so instrumental to everything that's going on in this movie? She uh she uh put a tracker on him. That's what it was. <laughs> <laughs> and doesn't Bruce Willis sure. use that stupid he uses that stupid method of like playing super loud music? <laughs> just Oh, I wrote down um Alt Rock Assassin should yeah. be his nickname. <laughs> just Alt Alt Rock Ninja. He was dressed as a ninja. Oh, mm, right. That's true. Right. Mm. Which again, why? Why? Oh, alt, alt rock ninja was my sort of uh, style back in the day. Actually, to be fair, <laughs> this movie has that like '90s alt rock kind of vibe, but like it's made by people that don't understand or like alt rock, so they're kind of just like working it in, but they don't understand how to make it good. I love. I, I actually laughed out loud at the start where you kind of have this montage of political events, and you have the you know the sound clip of um, a Bush saying "Tear down this wall." I believe it was him. Was that him? I think it's Reagan. Was it Reagan? Okay. Yeah. Uh, saying, yeah, tear down this wall. And it's like, tear down this wall. As like metal guitars kick in on cue. I was like, badass. <laughs> yeah, those 10 minute opening credits that felt like. <laughs> Just so I, silly. <clears throat> okay, I, I want to. It's interesting, really, because we're, we're all sitting here trying to figure out where this film went wrong. But I think I know where this film went wrong. And it's when Cam said that the guy who wrote this also was a Navy SEAL and wrote a book called Navy SEAL. No, a movie. Wow. That, 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 that was the death knell. That was exactly what we should have seen and, and, and been warned about before we even got here. Um, but the question I had about the a target. Now, the target in the Day of the Jackal is set out from the beginning, more or less. You know who it is. There's a slow build towards it, and they're trying to protect him. In this film, they have this weird thing where they're trying to have like a fake out of who they want their target to be, and then you learn it's the first lady, as if it's meant to be some gotcha moment. But you just end up going, huh, okay. He's not going to get her. But she's not a character, so you're like, okay, it's some other person. Yeah. It's ultimately pointless. Like It doesn't matter in the scheme of things for anything. It's like, oh, now we're just going to have a different character on screen that gets tackled by Sidney Poitier in the nick of time. (laughs) I just thought it was kind of bad taste, too, in that the event that he's going to assassinate her at is like cutting the ribbon at like a children's chemotherapy um, (laughs) wing of a hospital or something. And you have all these kids out there who are, um, I don't know if they were in real life cancer patients or if they were just actors. I have no idea. But it's just like, this is weird. (laughs) This is really weird. Got to make him evil. We got to know he's a bad guy. That's why he takes that hostage at the end. Up to that point, we were like, mm, not sure. Gray area. <laughs> has, he, has he tried to kill a child yet? Okay, now we know. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I, 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 I'm stumped by this film, guys. I really don't know what to do. Well, I just love when you look at the Day of the Jackal, you know, the attempted assassination at the end. He takes the shot and misses, goes to take the second shot, and they burst in. Here, it's like Bruce Willis just like blowing away an entire building with the machine gun. (laughs) It's crazy. Yeah, that's sort of a good sort of symbolism for the film, really, isn't it? There's there's the whole one shot and then there's a whole chain gun. Literally, your review, like you could just post a review of this movie and it would just be the picture of Edward Fox doing his target practice and Bruce Willis doing his target practice. And right there, you get the whole gist of, of kind of what this movie is. Oh, no. No, I'm putting the picture of them both topless cleaning cars next to each other. That's how I compare it. Um, I'm much more of a fox guy, I think. 
just it's so over the top and that's the problem with the movie too is like the original is very reserved in a lot of ways this one is just pure over the top when you have jack black's arm blown off and he's like screaming and blood spraying everywhere i'm just like i don't take any of this seriously also why would you do what he's said I, that that bugged the hell out of me especially the second time around because like he says oh you know I'm, he points the gun at jack black and then says run okay you would probably run but then he says, he shoots, he says, hold, hold your cigarette out, it's going to be fine. I would have kept running, firstly. And then second of all, he shoots your arm off. That's bad. And then Bruce Willis goes, hey, could you just move over to the car, please, after I've been shot? I would be out of there. I'm sorry, I'm not going to move into your target range while you, like, put holes in me. Thank you. And also, take a hard right or left, and that gun's not going to be able to hit you. Because if you watch the movie, it takes Bruce Willis a long time to aim this massive cannon. Run the other way. Like, don't run ahead of it. Like, I don't know why he doesn't just tackle it and then take a run back into the woods or something. Like, Maybe maybe this is really a secret slasher flick. It kind of is. Like, it, Bruce Willis feels like that, you know, a slasher in a, you know, 80s horror movie yeah he does the slasher thing at the end where they think they've killed him and he gets up and tries to shoot them again and then they shoot him mm -hmm. like four more times or something like the total slasher movie thing you got the stupid teen that's like running around and it's a drug addict <laughs> jack black <laughs> perfect yeah. to me it's like if this movie is going to be this overblown i want to see him get thrown in the way of the train i think at the end you've got to have bruce willis get tossed in that way of the train getting him shot at the end i'm like ah eh, boring yeah. What a, what a like downbeat ending for this like what's trying to be like an intense white knuckle ride, and then he just gets buried in an unmarked grave, and they both just walk off going, huh, well, that was an adventure. And again, another thing that doesn't work as well this time is the unmarked grave thing. And in, in the original movie, you're like, oh, cool, like yeah, we never actually found out who he is. And this one, you're like, I don't really care. Like, I don't, didn't get, nothing made me want to find out who he is. I I want to save that line. I don't really care. <laughs> Scott Hardy, The Jackal Review. I don't really care. And also, the movie it doesn't really do a very good job of setting him up as this really enigmatic guy where you're like, who could he possibly be? He comes across, just because it's Bruce Willis, is very American. So you're like, okay, he's pretty clearly American, I would assume. And uh, I think they even say he's American or someone thinks he's American early on in the movie. And I'm like, okay. I mean, I don't know that... There was a lot of mysteries dangling over his identity, whereas I would say the Ed Edward Fox one, there is, because he feels like a chameleon. You're like, who? this guy could be from anywhere in the original. It's crazy because, like, Edward Fox's character is so much more, like, of a full character, and we know less about him. Like, Bruce Willis, all that stupid stuff with Richard Gere, that backstory, but, like... We don't really know who, because his character's all over the place, right? Like, he's, like we said, we said he's, sometimes he's crazy, sometimes he's reserved. And, yeah, you don't really care, because you're like, oh, I know he, like, killed R Isabel's baby or something. <laughs> then they have a feud. I'm, I'm curious, Cam. Uh, I know that's your line, but I'll steal it this time. You were, you and Jeff, actually, our guest on the Day of the Jackal episode, were talking so much about how you're looking forward to me seeing this film. Now you've heard my thoughts about it, how did you think I would react? Yeah, probably like this. I don't know if this was a surprise. Okay. Okay. What would have surprised you? If you'd been like, guys, I love this movie. Oh my god. What pure 90s fun. I'm so glad we watched this. Oh, love it. Is there any, like, you know, five-star reviews of this or ten-star reviews, whatever your star system is? It was pretty badly reviewed. Um, I'm sure if you look up, maybe there's some kook like Rex Reed or something that gave it five stars, but by and large, uh, no. Not a lot of positive notices. Hmm. I was actually secretly hoping that one of you guys is going to love this movie. <laughs> <laughs> I, do you know, I watched the trailer, and this is actually something worth mentioning. The trailer for this film is terrific. It is a different film. It's a very different film because of the way it's cut. It's like all shadow boxing. You're like, fuck yeah. Come on, Richard Gere. Let's go get him. And then you just get this dire piece of trash. Well, it totally worked on me. Like when I was 16 or 17, like I thought that trailer looked awesome and I couldn't wait to see the movie. It got me in that theater opening weekend. Hmm? There you go. I, I had a follow-up question actually uh, for you, Brendan. Now, 
on your podcast, you're talking about what were they thinking? And, you know, I really, you know, my question is, you know, what were they thinking when they made this? What was going through Mr. Navy Seal's head? <laughs> I mean, I think he just wanted to make an action movie and somebody suggested this loose connection because as great as Day of the Jackal is, I don't see a studio looking at it and being like, yeah, there's some money to be made here. Like, I don't really, I like, I don't think Day of the Jackal, it's like a classic movie, but I think it's more like, you know, among like film fans. Like, I don't think it's a necessarily one that gets talked about a lot. So I think, yeah, someone, someone in the process said, you know, let's connect it to this movie loosely. I don't know who came up with that, but I think Michael Caton Jones just wanted to make another dumb action movie. Um, and, you know, Bruce Willis, that was a shoe in Of course I'll make money. Yeah. Richard Gere, right? Yeah. And it's like throw in some moments, you know, to loosely connect it all together from the original, but by and large, just kind of do your own thing. You know, you have the moment too here that's also not effective where they are torturing the guy to get information to reveal the jackal. That scene in the original, it's all done through audio where you're just hearing the scream mm -hmm. and you're like, oh man, that's chilling. Here you get to see it on screen. Like they constantly just take these little moments and then blow them up. Also, you know, the guy that the uh, jackal picks up in the gay bar later on, we see him graphically shot on screen versus the original where the jackal just goes around a corner and you kind of just get the sense something bad happened. Um, this movie just wants to kind of pay tribute to these little moments, but then blow them out of the water in terms of proportion. It, it also just speaks to me as something that's like, you know, these are great subtle moments, but people, people won't know what we're doing if we don't show them the guy being shot. Like if we don't show the explosion, oh, they better have a gunfight at the marina, even though this character is trying to remain like unnoticed. <laughs> like it just doesn't make, it doesn't, it doesn't really make sense. One, one thing I was just going to mention before we start to wrap up is it's interesting that they chose to make the Jackal a sociopath. Like I don't know. Obviously, we've decided that this is a this is the day of the jackal turned up to eleven. That's okay. You can you can do that script. You can do that story, and it can work. But to make him this like as we said, a slasher villain, a, a sociopath, I just don't know if that was the right avenue to go down. I don't know why they chose to make him this this cackling guy. Like he took pleasure in killing people. Edward Fox did not take pleasure in killing people. I feel like Edward Fox was a sociopath. This guy's a psychopath. Like, I feel like he's just, like, totally, like, you know, like, out of proportion evil in a way that, like, Edward Fox was just, had no morality whatsoever and was just willing to do whatever he needed to do to skate by. It's weird, too, because they almost, like, try to make, they almost try to go down that route for a little bit because they have Bruce Willis interacting with that girl who, I forget what she does, she gives him something early on, the ID, I think? The passports, yeah. Passport, yeah. And he's, like, charming with her and everything, and and you're like, oh, he's clearly not going to kill this woman, and he doesn't, and he leaves, and it's great. But that's, like, the only really time that happens, so you're just kind of like, why did they set that up? And now he's just, you know, like you said, a cackling psycho. Well, he doesn't kill the uh, the robot from Rocky IV. <laughs> <laughs> I loved when he was talking to the computer. I was dying of laughter. I can't believe we're only mentioning this now. This is like one of my biggest notes. <laughs> yeah. It's just like the, hello, welcome to Macintosh. What would you like? <laughs> it's just like incredible. It's just, a, it's just a crappy computer from 1997. And he's having like, he's not like, it's voice command number one. And number two, it's like a conversational in tone. Like he's like, oh, I've been looking for a gun. Like, where can you find me a gun? <laughs> I am your friend. I, I talk to Siri now and I'll say like, hey Siri, what's the temperature? It's three degrees right now. Boom. I, di I didn't mean for that to happen. <laughs> I had to say it now without causing Siri to hear me. Shut no, up. It's, we're keeping that in. Keep it in. It doesn't help my joke, though, Cam. Jesus Christ. <laughs> okay, well, I'll, I'll talk to that thing from time to time. And, you know, it can answer things like the weather. But if I ask it to buy a, a long-range uh, assault rifle, I think it might just point me to uh, internet websites that might help me in my search. <laughs> it won't broker a deal with me in Argentina. Also, I mean, I feel like if you're searching that on a basic, like, 1990s Mac, you probably get flagged somewhere. Also, I don't think a computer recognizes when you're just like, uh, too expensive. <laughs> <laughs> like, whoa, that's so stupid. 
Repeat. Repeat. That's, a, that's some like uh, TNG um, computer voice stuff where actually I can have a conversation with you, but we're not living in the 24th century. And that scene is so long. Like, it goes on forever, and I'm like, oh, so this is, like, them trying to do procedural. Like, this is the closest you get to it. <laughs> no, I thought it was them just thinking, this is a really cool idea, let's go as long as we can, and then just keep as much as we can in the film. Hey, Bruce, just keep talking to this box. There's nothing else in the room when they're actually doing it. It's just him talking to a guy off screen who's reading lines back to him. Guys, we gotta hit 127 minutes. Keep going. <laughs> Ask it about the weather. <laughs> and they're like... You nailed it, Bruce, today. Good job, good job. <laughs> and then some guy looked back at the rest of the crew and was like, guys, I think we're nailing it. <laughs> we, we got this. Yeah, we got this. We're making magic here. Do you think anybody on the set was like really like that? Like, you know, this is going to be one of those ones people talk about for a long time. It's Hollywood, baby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think every time Bruce Willis put on a different costume, he looked in the mirror and he was like, you're magic, baby. <laughs> Die Hard Who? <laughs> um, well, I think before we wrap up and tackle the knock list, um, I'm just going to throw it out to any final notes people have. I have one last note that's worth mentioning, and that is the inflation in price. Okay. So in the, the Day of the Jackal, uh, the Jackal himself charges $500,000 US, I should say, uh, to assassinate the president of France, Charles de Gaulle, whereas in The Jackal, in 1997, uh, The Jackal asked for $70 million to assassinate the First Lady. That's quite an increase. Well, would like the would a Russian mobster have that much money? That seems really high. I, I, it's out of my depth. I couldn't ask. Uh, if, if I had known beforehand, I would have asked some of my connections, but I'm, not, I'm really not sure. Sure. I'll go ask him. I'll go ask Bruce Willis's computer. That'll know. Because <laughs> uh, I can buy that they would have millions of dollars, but seventy million seems really high. Also, yeah. for like, because it's like the whole half now, half later gimmick from the first one, which was nice to see it come back. I have to say, I, I do like that line. Um, but if someone paid me thirty-five million, I would disappear. Mm. I'm sorry, I'm not assassinating anyone, and I'd be gone. Would it? Would you do that if it was the Russian mob you're dealing with? I mean, chances are you're not going to assassinate the first lady. Let's be honest. I'm going to take 35 million and disappear to an island somewhere you can't find me. I would not be there in the first place. <laughs> I, well, yeah, okay. That's, that's, that's the very sensible cam answer there. I appreciate you, that. You, you would go on Facebook and decline the, uh, the event <laughs> invite. Evite <laughs> from Russian mob. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Uh, maybe I'll just go with a maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh what about you brendan any final notes we haven't mentioned yeah just two really quick things um the scene where he <laughs> he breaks the glass of a car and coughs at the same time to cover the noise but then the alarm goes off like super loud <laughs> that was really dumb <laughs> i forgot uh... about that <laughs> I was like, wait a second. Um, <laughs> and then the other one is that a, a very important, uh, a very important character in the plot turn is Larry King as himself, because he's interviewing the first lady on TV, and he says, "So basically, what you're saying is it would uh, it would be very easy to assassinate a politician as long as people were willing to to deal with the consequences." And I'm like, what? The, who the hell would say that on <laughs> an interview with the first lady on television? And then Richard Gere is like. Like, oh, that's how he figures out that it's going to be the first lady? Like, it's so stupid. <laughs> you can't protect your women. Again, Navy SEAL, the movie. I was like, don't you dare say barbed wire again. Yeah. <laughs> don't call her babe. Uh, we can do Navy SEALs for the Patreon, Scott. Oh, no. I don't Charlie think Sheen, that... baby. I don't think yeah. they deserve it. I don't think they deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got a final uh, few things to mention as well. One, when Richard Gere is kind of skulking around the boats looking for Bruce Willis, and there's the two women in bikinis that are, are like, all over him. There's the one that goes like, hands off, girlfriend, he's mine. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> like, what is going on? This is like a fantasy moment for Richard Gere. He's like, can you please have these two women fawn over me? <laughs> oh, that was definitely, definitely in his rider. The first oh, yeah. take, the first take, they were just there, and then he saw them, and they had a word with the director to get them lines and get them in Hollywood. You know, we'll, we'll get you on set, we'll get you some lines. 
And then he partied with them on the boat that evening, I imagine. <laughs> was it, wasn't it that same scene where Richard Gere seemingly had like a Jaws 4 brain connection with Bruce Willis? Yes, that's right before the John Woo moment, yeah. <laughs> his, his, his spidey sense goes off. And like, he just kind of looks at the screen and I was like, wait, what? There's also a moment where Bruce Willis is like sitting in his hotel room and he's wearing a robe. And the robe is like half open. It's like one whole side of him is exposed. And I believe his ex-wife, Demi Moore, had a scene almost the exact same in Charlie's Angels Full Throttle. <laughs> yes, she did. And we questioned the hell out of it in that film, too. Mm-hmm. I didn't oh. have a problem with I didn't have a problem with seeing either of those two scenes, to be fair. Now you've brought that scene up, I don't know why it's there and why he's half-dressed. I didn't know why it was in Charlie's Angels Full Throttle, either, to be fair. Something for the ladies, guys. Sure. Yeah. Uh, 1997 Bruce Willis. He was, you know, he was looking good. He was looking good. And maybe he was, uh, he was still in like total like color of night mode in his head, and he was, <laughs> he was thinking like I gotta be naked in every scene in this, right? Yeah, he was. He felt liberated, and he wanted to really <laughs> uh, get it out there for the audience. Still, when are you guys talking about that one? That's a spy movie, right? Uh, is it? Not no, really. Not. Yeah. <laughs> Like we, we've walked the line. Yeah, yeah, maybe it's a Patreon thing. Actually, yeah, we're being yeah. really mean to our patrons uh, this episode. <laughs> Navy SEALs and <laughs> Color, Color of, of Night. night. <laughs> <laughs> we disappeared to zero subscribers overnight. There we go. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> um, my final note was one of the boats he walked past was called Miss Garbo, named after Greta Garbo, who we covered in Matahari. So mm. there you go. Spy Hearts Connection. Yeah. Garbo Hearts. Loving it. Um. Well, I think that brings us to the ultimate question, Cam. And as we have a guest, can you just spell out what the knock list is? Yes, the knock list is the need to see official classics of the Spy Hards canon, where every week we vote to see if the movie belongs on the list of the all-time great spy films. <laughs> and, um, you know, movies that have made it on, North by Northwest, GoldenEye, uh, Hannah, the Shersha Ronan movie, Three Days of the Condor. Um, so, yeah, we're going to decide if the Jackal belongs with those movies. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't. This is going to be tough, guys. Well, I know, I know, I know. You're a big fan, Brendan. I know. Um, I had, to, I had to really convince you to come and talk about this film because you love it so much. You've got the Blu-ray, <laughs> DVD, 4K yeah. restoration, everything. La- laser disc, VHS, poster yeah. on your wall. I can see it right now. It's glorious. Yeah. Uh, and also some weird topless photos of Bruce Willis. But we won't don't dig worry about into it. that. That's fine. No, we don't need to talk about no, it. No, okay. no, no. Um, Cam, did the Day of the Jackal make the knock list? It did, yes. Okay. So, hmm, can the remake make the knock list? Brendan, you're our guest. First vote goes to you. Yay or nay, the jackal? Nay. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, no, not at all. <laughs> well, okay, so if this is that bad, would you ever consider doing this on your show? Oh, yeah, 100%. Um, what's weird is I talked about this on, I talked about this movie once on another podcast because we talked about day of the jackal and then we thought it'd be fun to, uh, we thought it'd be fun. We were so silly, um, <laughs> to, to talk about the, uh, the American remake and yeah, no, it, it would definitely, it definitely qualifies to be on, uh, on, on my show as well. I, I caught that episode actually. And in the end, you're all just weeping for some reason. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, it was, it was bad. It was a bad scene. It was emotional um okay we have the movie was so good yeah yeah Yeah. it's the same as titanic in the same year (laughs) i'm surprised it didn't beat titanic to be honest with you yeah it should have swept bruce willis was like you know paint me like one of your french girls (laughs) oh god (laughs) that's why he had the robe open (laughs) no hey (laughs) no guys again that's color of night (laughs) Uh, um cam what about you not a chance in hell um i thought this movie stunk back in 97 and i still think the same thing has it gotten worse for you now, or better? Has it improved, or yeah, is it, has it gone either way? Has it stayed the same? Um, I think I was just like completely bored out of my mind in '97, whereas this time I was much more able to pin down exactly why it's terrible. So maybe that's the difference. Yeah, you've seen more bad movies by this point, so you know what truly makes things bad. That's right. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Well, that's two no's. Therefore, my vote is completely pointless. Um, but I think I've telegraphed it already. I hated this film. I it, I text Cam after that first message I mentioned earlier, and I followed up and said, I genuinely don't want to watch it a second time. I'm fearful of having to go back. 
And I have to say, my second watch was one of the worst two hours I've had to suffer through in my life. And I've been through some medical procedures that most people wouldn't even want. So, yeah, I would rather go through them than watch this film again. Hmm. So, Put it on the box. Scott, uh, are, you seem to be tiptoeing towards another question. I am. Uh, we mentioned this list earlier on in the show, funnily enough. <sighs> I think this film is bad enough for me to ask the question, Cam. What do you think? I think so. Okay. Brendan, as I mentioned earlier, we also have the disavowed list, which is the uh, the worst of the worst, the dregs, the the scum of the spy film genre. Some of the films we've had on there include Men in Black 2, uh, the Harry Palmer TV films. Uh, what else have we had? One of Our Dinosaurs is Missing is on there. Cam, anything else? Taken 2 and 3. Yeah, Taken 2 and 3. They're pretty bad. Anything else? Men in Black International. I think that's the uh, last of them. Yeah, some some pretty poor stuff. I I I don't use the word hate. I think hate's very strong, but I really didn't enjoy my time with this film, and I would rather do many things and watch it again. So, Cam, are we disavowing the Jackal? I can completely see disavowing the Jackal because you know you just in comparison to the original, it's like there's look there's lots of remakes that are inferior. You could look at them and you go, eh, yeah, that was not very good. They didn't seem to get the grasp of the original. So whatever. You kind of just ignore it, right? This is a case where I think it's like a fundamental misunderstanding of the original. And it's not like they made something interesting out of that misunderstanding. They made just a really, really bad 90s thriller that just doesn't work on really any conceivable level. Well, I mean, it's usually just us two that vote, but Brendan, what what would you do if it was disavowed? Would you vote for yes or no? Oh, disavow it. Dis- disavow the hell out of it. It's, it, like you said, it's, it, you're right. It has no idea what the source material is. It, it's, it's like, you know, there are some remakes, like you said, that are, most remakes are worse. Um, Like I think of like, even something like Dawn of the Dead, like it's not as good of a movie as the original, but it's perfectly fine. And it does something different. It's at least not a straight remake. Um, There, there are other, there are other ones similar to that, but no, this is just doesn't understand what it's, uh, what it's what it's even like you know a riff off of so yeah disavow the heck out of it offensively incoherent put it on the box that's it it's offensively incoherent it it fumbles what could have been an easy delivery you have a great cast a great script to work with and they didn't really need that much there's barely any dialogue in the day of the jackal yeah and they've just added tons of talking and melodrama and accents and more talking and jack black's arm being shot off which is probably my highlight just because i want to see that man in pain oh um disavow this sucker as you can see with the height of podcasting that's right that's right the nod once again is to man with the golden gun the corkscrew chase which is so amazing that is scored to a slide whistle the worst thing to ever happen in a james bond movie yeah um (laughs) unforgivable much like this remake so yeah the the navy seal guy i'm disavowing your film fella sorry about that it's awful let's bin it you see it's funny that you call it the navy seal guy movie whereas i think of it as the basic instinct to risk addiction guy movie (laughs) (laughs) i don't know what's worse but they both seem like an indictment I'd rather watch Navy SEALs any day of the week than Basic Instinct 2. I have not seen yet Basic Instinct 2 Risk Addiction, but it sounds like a delight. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, there you go, folks. The Jackal is not making the knock list, but it is being disavowed. And as such, the dossier on the film is complete and filed as classified. Brendan, thank you. And we apologize that you had to watch this film again. Oh, it was my pleasure. I, uh, I, well, you <laughs> loved great... it. Of course it was your pleasure. Uh, yeah. Again, the Bruce Willis posters all over the place here. Mm-hmm. Um, no, I took great, I took great pleasure in, in tearing this movie a new one. So no apologies necessary. And thank you very much for having me. Uh, well, I mean, just in, for the listeners as well, tell them a little bit more about the show and where they can find you. Yeah. So, uh, part of the, what were they thinking podcast? Uh, we talk about <laughs> movies like this a lot. Uh, you can find us on uh, Twitter and Instagram at WWTT podcast. We're on uh, age of radio. Of course you can head to the age of radio.org website. 
Um, and just search for us on Facebook or, you know, whatever podcast app you use, we're on there. So check us out. Awesome. And check for the links to that in the show notes. We'll have them there for you to find Brendan's shows. I'm uh, going to be sending them a list of some of our bad ones we've had so far. I want to hear you guys talk about Remo Williams. Hmm. That's a that's a rough ride. Uh, I've heard tale. I've heard tale, but never saw. Uh, yeah. Give us a call if you want to talk about it. It, it. I actually would be interested to revisit it. I don't know why. It's like a morbid curiosity when it comes to that film. I feel like my co-host may have seen it before, but I, 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 I've only heard of it and and heard you know people saying it's horrendous. Uh, don't forget the casual racism. Oh, really? That too. Well, that's a bonus, right? Yeah, that's 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 the uh, that's the garnish on the on the dessert. Um, but again, thank you, Brendan, for joining us. Cam, the question is to you: What are we doing next week? We are breaking the Sydney Poitier streak. We had little Nikita. We had the Jackal. Well, we're gonna have to take a break from Mr. Sydney Poitier because next week we are tackling the 1952 John Wayne film, Big Jim McLean, and. This is an obscure one. Uh, this is a 1950s film, I want to underline that, about the search for communists in Hawaii. Uh, the search for communists in Hawaii? Correct. I have a lot of questions. You'll have even more after watching the movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go, folks. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is somehow to watch Big Jim McLean and try not to laugh whilst you're saying that. And join us next week. You can, of course, find the knock list. Unfortunately, Spy Kids 2 didn't make it, but Spy Kids did. You can find out more about that on letterbox.com slash spyhards. Don't forget to follow us discreetly on social media at spyhards. That's S-P-Y-H-A-R-D-S on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But until next week, listeners, go along and we'll get along. <laughs>